From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. Team viewers still being abused for ransomware. Ransom schools reveal a hidden cost of ransomware. Mold. And watch for increasing sophistication from threat actors, says Experian. These are some of the stories that my colleagues and I have selected from this past week's cybersecurity headlines. We put them all up on a big cork board. We put some pegs in them. We connected them with string. We put, we found all the connections, and now we're ready for some insight, some opinion, and expertise from our guest, Mike Kelly, VP and CISO at the EW Scripps Company. Mike, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate your time. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it, Rich. All right, we're going to jump into the news real quick before we do so. I want to thank our sponsor for today, Conveyor, the most accurate AI for questionnaire answers just got better. Remember to join us on YouTube Live. Go to CISOseries.com, hit the events drop down, and look for the cybersecurity headlines week in review image. Just click on it. You can join us. If you're listening to this later, it's like, oh, I missed it. Hey, we are on at 3.30 Eastern every single week, so make sure you join us because you can contribute your comments in the chat. We've got CCL. We've got Maravell. We've got Tomcat. We've got David in there. They're all mixing it up. They're going to be asking questions, giving their comments, thoughts, maybe even some lulls. If we are lucky, we don't have time to look at them right now, though. we got 20 minutes, so let's get started. We will look at those as the show goes on. First up here, team viewers still being abused to breach networks in new ransomware attacks. According to the security crim Huntress, the popular remote access tool team viewer is still being used by ransomware actors to break into the endpoints of organizations to deploy encryptors. TeamViewer, in a statement, reminded customers that most instances of unauthorized access involve a weakening of TeamViewer's default security settings through the use of easily guessable passwords, which is only possible by using an outdated version of their product. The company stresses the need for complex passwords, two-factor authentication, allow lists, and regular software updates, what we're going to be calling uh, (laughs) basic best practices here. So, Mike, this is uh, the case, perhaps the most infamous TeamViewer incident, uh, the Oldsmar Florida water treatment hack from existing almost exactly three years ago, so blow out those birthday candles, where the password was shared among the technicians causing the issue. As a CISO, I guess, what would you say to users of any form of remote access software in addition to, hey, maybe don't share passwords? Right. Well, I mean, first of all, I can see team viewers' point of view on this. Yeah. You know, if they're saying is what this is really true, that only versions of their product that are older allow for these weaker passwords. I mean, it's like eating food that's gone beyond its expiration date, right? We all understand this concept. You buy it at the store, it's got expiration date. You generally don't need it. I mean, I might do it if it's my favorite piece of cheese that's a little old and moldy, I might cut it out and eat it. But in generally, why do we do this when it comes to technology, right? I, well, I yeah, that's the, that's the thing. Like, like I understand if you're an SMB or something like that. But yeah. if, you know, I mean, if you if you have a a certain level of sophistication, this does seem like a table stakes. Hey, you know, like click, you know, have IT click the update, or you click, you know, yep. whoever needs to click the update. Yeah, I think the ch- the challenge we're running into though is um, technology debt is a little bit different. So it's not really a fair, complete analogy. It's organizations are transforming so quickly that tech debt builds up over time. So I can understand. You know, I think TeamViewer has some culpability here when you're building products that are legacy and outdated and you know your customers are doing it. Maybe you got to do a better job of communicating with them, right? Maybe you got to give them some notices so they're aware that they're at risk of a, using these older versions. So, um, but yeah, not sharing uh, or not using weak passwords, that's obviously a big problem. But I think the bigger challenge we're finding in this, the space of remote access control tools and remote access software is a lot of the people that are actually trying to secure these are not the ones purchasing them. Mm, They're typically uh, done within the business, right? mm -hmm. And then this is debt that sometimes is hidden in the networks and we got to react and respond to it. So, um, you know, yeah, I I think you got the general best practice you mentioned, we got to continue to do those. But in the meantime, I think not just TeamViewer, but other software providers like this, They've got to do a better job of communicating with their clients, too, and customers and making sure that they're aware of these risks and not waiting for something super bad to happen to then say, yeah, I told you so. You should have just been following these and don't use an outdated version. Yeah. At a certain point, like that, that old app maybe shouldn't be able to, you know, be a remote, you know, be a platform like like maybe there's a there's a deprecation of functionality that may make some customers mad, too, though. So, again, uh, uh, kind of a, a balancing act for sure. Yeah. All right. Next up here, ransom schools reveal a hidden cost of ransomware mold. 
One of the lesser discussed but still serious outcomes of ransomware attack was revealed last month when the Pawtucketville Memorial Elementary School of Lowell, Massachusetts, released its indoor air quality assessment prepared by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Mold growth in the elementary school caused a delay in its opening due to conditions that appear to have been brought on by the past summer by an HVAC problem caused by a cyber attack on the city of Lowell. So, Mike, often the outcomes of ransomware attack is two years of credit monitoring and, you know, a quiet return to normal. Uh, but here we're seeing institutional issues, uh, you know, kind of similar to, you know, when we see hospitals that have to turn away ambulances after being hit by a cyber attack. I'm curious, you know, does is this a situation of, hey, this this hits closer to home? You know, we might we might see some some different action on this when it's, hey, my kids breathing in a mold. Yeah, it is funny as we've come full full circle back to mold. <laughs> Speaking of the cheese and the old is cheese is old and moldy. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, as a parent, yes, yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to certainly take notice of something like this. But it's 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 headlines like these that I think my bigger takeaway is that every t- every company is a technology company, whether you like it or not. We're all running on technology. Yet, right? yeah. You just don't know it. But ransomware will tell you ransomware will absolutely tell you that you're a technology company. So, you know, these unexpected consequences of systems being offline, they are hard to predict. And the more we connect these systems, the more we digitize our operations, it's it's difficult. And I'll be honest, this is not something, I mean, if I was supporting the school, I would have never thought of. It's not something easy. And in fact, if you look back 2015, I think it was, no, 2013, maybe back in the day, Target, it was an HVAC, right? It came mm-hmm. from the HVAC is where it began. So these things are hard to to conceptualize when we're connecting systems to the network faster than we can secure them. So I think what we got to think about, you know, is we need to think about each component within our network can affect our operations. I I just saw, I think it was an article maybe last week um, on LinkedIn about how a smart wrench Oh, the the nut runner. network. We, we, yeah. we covered this on the, the weekend right? review last week. Yeah. Right. You know, my my short little quip, smart little uh, quip on LinkedIn was uh, you dodge a wrench, you dodge ransomware. Right. <laughs> um, but yeah, at the yeah. end of the day, we, we, it, the thing is, we, we have to think about is the value of connecting whatever device or whatever system to the network, is it worth the value of the, and the effort of securing? And that's that you know, system mindset we need to think about. It's got to be more systemic risk thinking and not just isolated. Hey, I'm going to take this thing. I think it's got value. You got to understand how that can affect others down the chain. Yeah. And kind of going back to the last story. And, you know, a lot of this is the business bringing a connected HVAC system to security and saying, well, now we have to secure it, you know, like, right. like, so that like connecting that, how like the, this need to the business, right. That this isn't yep. just, Oh, it's all benefit from connecting. Like we, yeah, we need to figure out how, how these can impact operations, positive and negative Correct. Uh, theoretically yep. before we bring them online. That'd right. be the ideal. All right. Next up here, Australia sanctions a Revil hacker behind MetaBank data breach. Australia announced Tuesday that it will leverage its new cyber sanctions against a Russian national, Alexander Genedevich Ermakov, allegedly a member of the Revil ransomware group and responsible for the 2022 hack of Australia's health insurance provider, MetaBank. While Ermakov's arrest is unlikely, Australia's new sanctions allow uh, the country to impose travel bans and asset freezes. The, those who attempt to provide assistance to Ermakov could also face imprisonment and heavy fines. Australian authorities are confident that simply naming Ermakov will cause significant harm to his cyber operations. He's a hot potato, don't want to do business. The United States and the United Kingdom also announced sanctions against Ermakov. And I'll just say his name one more time, Ermakov. So, Mike, maybe some kudos deserved for taking this same tact of Hey, ruining reputations uh, as they, you know, theoretically do with their victims. Naturally, another person will spring up in his place. This isn't an institutional takedown of Revil or anything like that. But I'm curious, do you see a potential for more success when authorities can insert some chaos into opponents' lives? Yeah, I mean, I think any way we can we can disrupt threat actors, in my opinion, we're at least moving the needle, mm-hmm. right? If we're making it more difficult for them to gain business because their reputation's damaged, right? People may want to avoid working with this. You know, his identity. Many of these people, by the way, they, they they it takes a long time to build up a trusted reputation in these sites, right? So that's a lot of damage. That's a lot of value lost. Um, and that's disrupting his operations. We've seen things with which is good. I think the government's doing a better job in working interactively uh with other governments to, you know, take down infrastructure that's creating a lot of this havoc. I mean, is it gonna deter the activity to your point completely? No, it won't. But Anytime we are 
adding cost to the threat actors, that's harming their business, right? Yeah. So I think it's I think it's a good thing. I think it's vital that we continue these coordinated activities between the governments because um, I think it'll stem the tide of attacks. It won't eliminate them. Mm-hmm. And already, I mean, there's been also several cases already where a threat actor that's on this list shows up in a, in a country with extradition laws and they've been caught. You know, they, they make mistakes along the way too, just like we may make a mistake in cybersecurity and our defenses and they get through. So we'll see. But uh, yeah, I think it's good. I think it's it's this is one of the better articles I thought for the week, at least a positive note. Yeah, and uh, CCL in our chat is uh, backing you up here. That doxing action is just badass. <laughs> CCL, not uh, mincing any words there. I like that. And uh, hey, uh, Adam's in the chat uh, representing Cincinnati as well. So good to have you here, Adam and CCL. Hey, Adam. Adam's on my team. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's it's interesting thinking about that. You know, these these threat actors are operating businesses. Uh, we see that increasingly like in very like real terms. And think about like if a business had to replace their uh, a C-level executive, there's going to be all sorts of, or, or I also think of like a merger and acquisition situation where you're bringing in extra risk by that transition or more opportunity yep. for uh, authorities to move in. So yeah, right. a really good perspective. All right. Uh, next up here before the break, X adds support for pass keys on iOS. X, formerly Twitter, if you haven't checked your news in a while, announced Tuesday that it will support the use of pass keys. And these offer a user more secure login methods than just traditional passwords. And it's basically catch up, right? Apple, iOS, Google, PayPal, TikTok, WhatsApp, the passkey revolution is well underway. Uh, these use biometric authentication, things like face ID, touch ID, maybe a pin, physical security key that you might have a UB key or something like that to validate login attempts, therefore combining the benefits of two-factor authentication into a single step. So Mike, clearly X looking to make amends perhaps to the uh, SEC uh, embarrassment, a couple of high profile uh, account takeover breaches that they've seen. I'm curious, are you observing the average person getting comfortable with passkey technology? Uh, you know, the, they are the people that are going to, you know, kind of make or break uh, uh, how successful these are, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, I Twitter X, I, I still have a, have a hard time calling it X, but yeah, <laughs> it's X, right? But yeah, I yeah, think the, the mental break, right? Yeah. <laughs> But I, I think the, the the concerns of privacy and like biometrics, they're from yesteryear, right? I think we're well beyond that. The way people are, I think we're embracing technology at such a rapid pace that I think things like this, people will realize the value of it. It is making it more secure. I think some of those privacy concerns that are happening, as soon as they see that it's really adding that much security value, I'm hoping to see there is more adoption of this. Um, and anytime we're securing things with less friction, that's that's awesome, right? Um, but with that being said, you know, let's not forget that X about a year ago, they got rid of the SMS text-based MFA for all free accounts, and you have to pay to get that that feature, right? Yeah. So I think some of this is is, hey, oops, we you know we made an oopsie back then. Um, now you know back then their opinion on it was we should be using app authenticators and that's the appropriate path to secure, not SMS because we all know that's not as secure. And to be fair. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Well, Well, to be fair. I was going to say, it's also a cost cutting, you know, that that, that, that services aren't free. So that's, (laughs) that's maybe the other reason too. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah. You got to make it a profitable platform. I get it. He's selling it that way, but you know, Mm -hmm. we all know that that was not the real, the value that was being sold. It was, that's going to cost me money. Mm-hmm. It's less secure, and I'll, I'll land on that. And that's that's ultimately how this attack happened on CC. It was a SIM card swapping attack, which allowed them to get access to the account. So, yeah, do I think it's going to be um, good for the future? Will people adopt this? I sure hope so. I think it's the right step. I think more providers need to do this um, because, again, anytime we can remove friction from the process and still add security, I think that's a win-win situation. I mean, I just know for myself today, I got I, I got probably multiple multi-factor authentication solutions over the years based on when I created my accounts many years ago, they didn't support some authenticators, but they supported others. So over the years, now I have this multi, multi-factor, multi-authenticated <laughs> uh, solutions in place. So anyhow. Well, maybe we can all uh, live the dream of Tomcat. Uh, he says, uh, uh, I uh, yeah. have a dream that one day we will live in a passwordless society, a beautiful, beautiful passwordless society. Uh, well, before we move on, we have to spend a few moments with today's sponsor, Conveyor. AI can now literally answer any question in seconds, yet InfoSec teams are still in a living nightmare, manually filling out questionnaires. 
Conveyor's AI can now use your uploaded security documents to auto-generate precise answers to entire questionnaires. The software one of their customers dubbed my favorite security tool of the year in 2023 has gotten even better. And it takes just minutes to get started. Try a free proof of concept at conveyor.com. Next up here, predictions on threat actor potential for the near future. We've got two kind of prediction-y stories here, so we're putting these together. First up, the UK's National Cybersecurity Center published an assessment maintaining it was almost certain, kind of its highest level of confidence, new AI tools would cause an increase in ransomware attacks with an uneven benefit to threat actors. This was leaning on academic material, open source tools, industry insight, and classified intelligence for this finding. And the NCSC said right now, AI tools assist with reconnaissance and social engineering, so kind of current state tools, but likely are going to extend to malware development and vulnerability detection, at least for highly resourced threat actors. And then there's Experian's 11th annual data breach industry forecast. And this includes six predictions that they suggest will cause even more excitement in the cybersecurity industry this year. Uh, This includes things like the expansion of third-party vendor breaches to fourth, fifth, even sixth party breaches. I I literally just got a shiver up my spine. Also maintaining, uh, uh, also manipulating tiny bits of data, such as transportation coordinates to cause chaos, attacks on supply chains for rare earth materials, and insider activities, things like learning stock market insights early to earn cash through legitimate markets. So Mike, a lot of of predictions there, but from your threat analysis perspective, I guess, what do we make of these? Yeah, I mean, I agree with a lot of the perspectives in both of these uh, articles. I like the, um, I'm looking at the the Brits, uh, the AI impact and ransomware. I think that was a little more enlightening. Some of the stuff I had an experience, it was kind of like a little bit of an eye roller. A lot of those are kind of <laughs> obvious. We've always talked about supply chain attacks, how cascading supply chain attacks are going to continue. We've seen them. We've seen them multiple years. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's going to naturally, the inclination is that will continue um, move it was move it software. There are still things coming out from move it. Right. So I think that's, that's obvious, but I think the comment they made in the article with the, the, uh, the British government and how they talked about the emergent use of AI and cyber attacks is going is evolutionary, not revolutionary. I think that's spot on, right. It's not going to revolutionize how security is done. In fact, we've done AI in the past within tool sets, maybe not gen AI, mm-hmm. but we've used AI for many years. I think what's going to happen is the the AI may lower the barrier for entry. It may make attacks more scalable for simple attacks, simple threats, you know, like phishing. Yeah. Um, I think more advanced attacks, and they, they, they kind of alluded to this in the article, but I think the more advanced attacks using exploits, they're going to need time and they're going to need more data, high quality data to make these more sophisticated. So I think we have a window of time when Gen AI from the threat perspective is going to be... Um, significant enough where it could cause real disruption but in the meantime within our own tool sets we're already starting to use gen i right that's kind of being built into these products so i think it was interesting uh, i like the the brit version better but <laughs> overall it was pretty pretty spot on yeah and and really great point about you know uh that it would take highly sophisticated actors to build up the data sets to really uh, take advantage of these. Obviously, you can try and you know do prompt injections on legitimate tools and stuff right. like that. And and we've seen that there are some significant gaps uh, in in those as well. But but yeah, just looking at kind of the scale that you need to operate to to kind of take advantage at least current state. Uh, you know, and I I also like that distinction of you know what we're using it for now, where where the future is going to go. I think that's that's pretty great. Uh, next up here, cybersecurity startup funding down 50%. This comes from new figures from Crunchbase that show cybersecurity startups saw that big dip in funding, pulling in $8.2 billion in 2023. I mean, I would take that money. The lowest, though, since 2018. That's down 50% on the year and 65% compared to 2021. For some perspective and some context here, YL Ventures senior partner Ofer Schreiber characterized this as a come down from bloated valuations that we saw in 2021, a lot of uh, startups getting money in kind of the pandemic fueled uh, investment craze. Analysts also noted that interest in uh, the market remains high for these startups and could see significantly more investment this year as firms look for security solutions specifically around AI. So Mike, this kind of sounds like asking if it'll rain and getting the reply it might uh but not much concrete here i'm curious though what are you seeing kind of in the startup market yeah i I, yeah i I do i i'm heavily engaged in startup communities i like looking at what's next even when i go to the conferences 
like an RSA, I start outside and mm-hmm. kind of work my way in because that's where you <laughs> see all the disruption happening. Um, did did we maybe reach a dot com bubble for cybersecurity? We might be right. I think with all the concerns around the economy, uh, it's it's tougher to find um, you know money. I think uh, it's not great for startups to be honest right now in cybersecurity. But on the buy side, it's going to reduce a lot of the noise. I think that some of the value that comes from this is we don't have 50 million products trying to do one thing. So my what, what I think is going to happen, and I think they kind of alluded maybe in this article a little bit, is I anticipate the intersection of AI and cybersecurity is where we're going to see funding for the products. That's the ones where we're going to see focus, where they're actually solving real world thorny problems. In fact, I think your little commercial you just mentioned there before talks about using AI yeah, to help deal with all these problems of these million questionnaires that that customers are getting right and, and uh, to answer those. So I think I think that's where we're going to see that, that value. What we don't need is we, we don't need another EDR solution, for example. There's plenty in the market. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of what I what I think right now. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I, I, I want to put a pin in this and like set that reminder for a year from now to see where we are at with these figures, because it does seem like I mean, like the the, the AI hype is just, you know, Obviously, there's some lag in VC funding when it comes to that, but yeah, I could I could almost see this like 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 uh, like SEO, like you know we we've seen yep. AI compared to like a search level opportunity for for a lot of companies, and I'm wondering if yeah, even in cybersecurity, we'll see like kind of that that initial SEO boom where everybody thinks they can do it and uh, right. and everybody hey let's throw let's throw a couple million at them right uh, <laughs> we get some equity it's no problem. Uh, All right. Our last story here uh, for today, Thailand court attempts to suppress data leak. The operator of a dark web site uh, uh, announced on an illicit forum that it held a data set of over 55 million people in Thailand. This data includes names, ID card numbers, phone numbers, and birth dates. So we don't know how many unique individuals are in this data set. If they are all unique, though, that would mean data on about 83% of the country's population, just for some scale of how big this is for that country. The criminal court of Thailand ordered a block placed on the site. Resecurity analysts passed on a report that the country's rural doctor society suspected the leak originated from the public health ministry's immunization center. So, Mike, in your mind, what impact would a court order block on a dark website have? I mean, isn't that why they're dark? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think at a minimum, they're setting a tone here. I think that's what's mm-hmm. important. They're setting a tone that the Thai government is cracking down on cybercrime. And I think that sends messages, at least, um, to, you know, is it international crime? Yeah. I mean, you're not going to be able to stop things like that, but at a the minimum, they're at least setting a tone that they're getting serious in cyber crime. Mm-hmm. And in this article, I think what was actually good, the bigger story was, is that Thailand is maturing in their capabilities. I think that's good. I think it's good for all of us. They are a, a you know, an allied country in this uh, fight against cyber crime. So uh, I, I think what was that earlier or, article? We're just talking about how the coalition of governments are helping coordinate attacks so in Mm -hmm. my eyes it's another positive it's good on a friday it's good to have two two signs of at least positivity in cyber security because we don't always get that so for me i thought this was um will it stop the activity no it's gonna they're gonna find a different place to do it at but at a minimum hey we're setting some tone and we're getting more joining the cyber crime fight yeah, I, I would. I, I completely agree, and and yeah, that's kind of the meta narrative of this is is that maturation of of focus and capability. I would, you know, like I, I'm, and I'm sure the the government is taking this seriously. I would like to see uh, some again some follow on of like a a national have I been pwned kind of for this, so that you know because there are you know ID card numbers like just all this fodder for for social engineering yep. and a lot of uh, abuse um for that but yeah definitely um and and setting up the 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 idea that there will be punitive action you know kind of for if if yeah, hey we find out you're visiting the site it's not gonna be good don't go right there. Okay. right no, right that, that is the point of that right mm-hmm. the, the the stick is waiting for you <laughs> Uh, one of the, you know, like you said, it's always good to have good news to end the show on. And it's also good to have some great comments going on in our chat. So thank you to everybody, uh, that was getting in there. Andrea C, uh, uh, getting in there uh, a little late, uh, CCL, Adam, Tomcat, uh, David, all of them getting in there, sharing their thoughts. Uh, I was like, in uh, uh, CCL was agreeing with me. Team viewers should start blocking older versions. CCL, 
agreeing with the host, always a good way to get your comment on the, uh, uh, at least mention. Uh, before we get out of here, uh, Mike, was there any story that was a thumbs up or an eye roller for you that stood out? You mentioned one that you really, you, you really liked. Was there, was there one that surpassed it? I, I just, I like the sanctions. I think, I think we're, yeah. And even that last one, the Thai government, I think mm-hmm. positivity in terms of it's not, we know it's not going to stop it, but Hey, it's nice to end the week on some positivity, at least is the way I kind of look at it. <laughs> This is what I like. And another way you can end your week with some positivity is by following Mike on the cyberspace. Uh, uh, where can people find you if they want to uh, increase their happiness, Mike? Oh, well, thank you. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think the backslash Mike Kelly. I used a little URL on that one. So um, also, though, I might if I don't if you don't mind, I want to yeah, do absolutely. a little um, mention of uh, OTA wireless. Um my company, I think I, I was on here earlier this this month. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're talking about some of the things we're doing there. I'm involved with this. We're in a joint venture right now with a major broadcaster where we are now delivering data at scale. So with our broadcast towers, we have some new capabilities. It's just basically a new way of delivering data one to many. So if anybody's listening out there, has data needs to send the devices, endpoints, come find us at otawireless.com. We are a fast efficient and cost-effective way of delivering data. Fantastic, Mike. And we will have all of those links in the show notes. If you didn't catch them, just look uh, for wherever you find this, you will find those links. Uh, So thank you so much, Mike Kelly, the VP and CISO at EW Scripps Company. Really appreciate your time, your insight, just just dropping the great takes here and and leaving us with some, you know, telling us it's okay to have good news in cybersecurity. (laughs) I don't think we hear that enough. That's awesome. Uh, Thanks also to our... Absolutely. Thanks also to our sponsor, Conveyor, the most accurate AI for questioner answers just got better. And thanks to our audience today. Uh, like I said, Adam, Tomcat, David, CCL, if, I miss it, if I'm missing your name, it's because I'm not seeing it directly in my feed right here. But anyone that was commenting uh, or who even wants to comment, thank you so much uh, for being in there. And remember, you can join us every Friday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern and get in on that chat. Remember also uh, to join us next Friday, we are going to be doing another Super Cyber Game Show Friday. This is a whole hour where we play cyber games. The audience gets involved. We have some guests on uh the fun times will be had by all we just had the debut episode earlier today it was a ton of fun so if you want to get uh nerdy and have some fun with some cyber games make sure you get on that hey bring your team over have a little hour uh, uh lunch hour some fun with that that's at 1 p.m uh this coming friday uh, eastern 1 p.m eastern so make sure you check that out and we'll be back with another weekend review show and of course you can get your daily news through cybersecurity headlines every single day give us about six minutes we'll get you all caught up until the next time we meet i'm rich straffolino reminding you to have a super sparkly day Cybersecurity headlines are available every weekday. Head to CISOseries.com for the full stories behind the headlines.